Maximum likelihood estimation is the most common estimation technique for structural equation models. However, there are scenarios where you might want to consider alternative estimation techniques. For example, if you are working with categorical data, the weighted least squares or diagonally weighted least squares can be a more appropriate alternative to maximum likelihood because that estimator assumes that the data are normally distributed and a categorical variable most certainly is not multivariate normal. Let's take a look at the idea behind these alternative estimation techniques. So this is the equation for the maximum likelihood estimation. And the idea was in maximum likelihood estimation is that we try to minimize the difference between the model implied correlations sigma and the actual observed correlations or covariances in the data s. And uh, this is the discrepancy function. Understanding where that comes from or what that means is not particularly useful, at least in my opinion, for an applied researcher. But if you want to know how this is derived and what the different parts mean, you can look at, for example, Bolland's book Appendix 4a that derives this equation starting from the multivariate normal distribution. This equation can actually be expressed in, in a different way that makes its meaning a bit more clear. The discrepancy between these implied matrix sigma and observed matrix S can also be understood as a weighted sum of the differences between individual elements. So instead of having the covariances as a matrix, which is a maybe four by four matrix, we will have the unique elements of the sample covariance matrix and the model implied covariances in two vectors. So they're basically just a sequence of numbers that have one dimension. And then we take a weighted sum of uh, squared differences. So that's what the equation basically is. So this is called weighted least squares because we multiply the difference between S and sigma always with itself and a weight. And uh, we multiply different pairs as well using the weight matrix. And choosing the, the W based on implied matrix produces the ML estimator. So for example, uh, the EQS structural equation modeling software uses this estimation approach and it produces identical estimates compared to that equation here. So if we just take uh, the weight matrix W here and then uh, we construct that based on the model implied matrix sigma, then this will produce the maximum likelihood estimates. But there are also other interesting ways to weight the difference between the sample covariances and the implied covariances. And uh, the, the interesting alternatives are uh, generalized least squares. That's um, interesting for a statistician because it performs fairly similarly to the ML. So in applied research, there are very, very few reasons to use GLS, but for completeness, if you want to understand these techniques, you can uh, read about GLS. The more interesting variables are asymptotically distributed free estimator, which is sometimes referred to as ADF estimator or WLS estimator referring to weighted least squares or AGLS, which is asymptotically a distribution free GLS estimator. And uh, then there is diagonally weighted least squares, which is uh, a simplification of the asymptotically distribution free estimator. These two estimators are useful when you are dealing with uh, non-normal data sets and particularly if you have large models with categorical variables then they would be almost always estimated with either of these two techniques because maximum likelihood techniques for categorical variables are computationally very demanding. Let's take a look at, at what these are uh, what these estimation techniques actually do and what is the meaning of different equations. And we'll need some data. I'll be using this R code. So the R code basically shows that we have a, a factor, single factor model with three indicators. And uh, then we fit the model using different techniques. S contains uh, the uh, sample covariances of the data. And uh, then WLS period OBS contains the, the matrix or the vector of the observed vari variances and covariances. Let's take a look at the, uh, the content of these elements. So the S matrix is here. That's our sample covariance matrix. 
and uh, the, the WLS vector is basically just the same information arranged a bit differently. So instead of arranging everything as a matrix, you have a vector. So we have a vector of differences here and vector of differences here. We multiply bo on both sides, from both sides, the weight matrix using these differences and that produces a weighted least squares because each each element, each difference is taken twice. So you first multiply from the left side, then you multiply from the right side the weight matrix and that produces you a, a, a single weighted sum of squares. So this is the S matrix and, and this is the, uh, the S vector. And uh, if we apply a W that is diagonal, then that produces unweighted least squares estimator. So the ULS estimator is not particularly useful, but it is easy to uh, for, for teaching purposes to start with this. So the idea of ULS is that we simply take each difference, we, we weight each difference equally and we multiply the difference with just itself. We multiply the difference with just itself, just itself, just itself. So we just take uh, these uh, differences, we square them and we take a sum. So that's unweighted least squares estimator. Okay, so in this particular case, the, the variances and covariances are roughly uh, in the same ballpark. So there is no big reason to believe that one of these indicators is, is more important than others. So let's multiply the indicator x1 by 2 for demonstration purposes. Now we can see that the variance of x1 is a lot greater. It's about four times as, as large as variance of x2 or x3. And now if we look at the absolute discrepancy, between x1, the, the actual observed x1 variance and the implied x variance, then we should be, we should tolerate larger differences. So if we say that uh, the difference of let's say 1, we estimate that the residual for, for the uh, variance of x1 is 1, that's a lot smaller difference relatively to the current observed variance than if we say that the residual for x2 is 1. So that would be a very big difference compared to the observed, uh, observed value. So these are uh, the variance of x1, how much it differs from the implied variance in absolute terms should be a less important factor in model estimation than how much x2 differs from the implied value on, on absolute sense. Another way of thinking about this is that if we take repeated samples of, of this data, if x1 has a larger variance, then the variance of that variance of a repeated samples is going to be larger than the variance of, of x2 or variance of variance of x2 over time. So whenever we, we take repeated samples, we estimate, a different, we estimate the variance of x1 in each sample and those sample estimates of the variance vary. So we have a variance of a variance. Also we can see that because x1 and x2 are correlated, then uh, if x1 has a large variance, then x2 should have a large variance in the sample as well. Let's say that there is an outlier in x1. If x1 and x2 are correlated, then that variable should be an outlier in x2 as well. So both variances will go up in a particular sample. And we need to take the, the fact that not all of these covariances and variances produce, uh, provide us the same amount of information about the model into account when we do the weighting process. So this is the maximum likelihood weight matrix and this is the inverse that we actually use here. So we can see that there are the variance x1 has a weight of 0 0.03 compared to the 0 0.20 in x2. So uh, that's about what eight fold difference. And uh, it's because the variation of x1 is larger. So we should, we should pay less attention to x1 and x2, the absolute difference between the implied and observed correlates. So this is, uh, this is nice to know. And, uh, if we compare this uh, ML weight matrix to the GLS weight matrix, they are very similar. The, the reason here is that the GLS weight matrix is calculated based on these correlations, these observed correlations, and the maximum likelihood weight matrix is calculated based on the sigma, the implied correlations, 
and because this is a just identified model the implied correlations and observed correlations are identical once when the model converges and, and these, these small discrepancies are just because of the numerical estimation process. So there are, the problem with this is that we are now estimating a large matrix here based on a small correlation matrix. So uh, we cannot estimate these um, elements uniquely based on this information because this matrix is larger than that matrix. So there is some redundancy here. Particularly we assume that the data are multivariate normal and there is no excess kurtosis. So for example uh, the correlation how much uh, let's say x1 and x3 correlate and, and x2 and x3 correlate how much those two correlations correlate over repeated samples depends on the kurtosis of the data. Here we assume that there are the kurtosis is uh, there is no excess kurtosis data are multivariate normal and but if that is not true then these weight matrices will produce biased results. So another alternative is to uh, not use correlation matrices but to estimate the, the weight matrix from the raw data when we take kurtosis into account. And this produces the asymptotic distribution free weight matrix or asymptotic distribution free weight matrix. This is uh, this used to be called ADF but now it's more commonly called WLS estimator. However this technique uh, while it seems uh, appealing that we, we drop the normality assumption from, from maximum likelihood estimates and go for a more general approach where all these elements are estimated from the data instead of uh, assumed based on, on normal distribution. This comes with two big issues. The issue number one is that there is a, there's a computational difficulty. So this weight matrix tends to be very large and it needs to be inverted in the estimation process and this is difficult to do for computers. So calculating WLS estimations for a large model takes a long time and it may not, act, may not even work. Another important thing is that estimating these uh, this weight matrix in a way that is stable requires a very large sample size because kurtosis is difficult to estimate and it varies a lot from one sample to another. The sample size requirements for, for WLS are in the hundreds, 200 probably not enough, 400, 600 could be enough or in the thousands depending on how complex your model are. Because of these two issues the requirement that you, you invert a large matrix which is computationally difficult and the fact that these off-diagonal elements tend to be unstable there is another alternative that applies the same idea by estimating this from data without assuming any distributions and it is called the diagonally weighted least squares estimator. So the DWLS estimator simply takes the, the weighted least squares estimator or ADF estimator and just uses the diagonal. And this has been proven to be consistent but it is less efficient in very large samples. However in practice this DWLS estimation techniques or weight matrix works a lot better in small samples than the WLS weight matrix and this is actually very commonly used with categorical data in if the sample size is not very large. So summary of these estimation techniques. Unweighted least squares it is easy to understand you can easily program unweighted least squares in Excel and, and uh, use Excel solver to minimize the unweighted sums of, of squares differences between the implied matrix and the observed matrix. GLS and ML both assume multivariate normality. ML is more uh, statistically appealing so for that reason GLS is not very commonly used. ML is the default alternative that you should go for unless the data are severely non-normal. For example, if you have categorical data. Then we have WLS slash ADF est estimator, which is uh, an ideal estimator if the sample size is very large, but in small samples it is difficult to calculate and it might, might be biased and inefficient in small samples. In practice, we use the diagonally weighted least squares which just takes the diagonal matrix of the ADF matrix and, and that gives us better estimates in small samples. 
Then there are also robust variants of, of these, all these techniques. And the robust, particularly in this context, it does not mean anything about the estimation. It, it refers to uh, estimating the standard errors in a robust way. So the same thing when you do regression with robust standard errors, the coefficients will be the same. If you do a uh, MLR, MLR robust maximum likelihood, the estimates will be maximum likelihood, standard errors will be calculated using the robust formula. And also the test statistic, the chi-square has similar kind of robust variance. These techniques cover pretty much everything that modern SCM software can offer, including Stata, M plus or Lavan, and except for some missing data procedures that are, are estimated a bit different from, from these approaches. But yes, this is the, uh, if you understand all of the, what I explained in, the, in this video, you basically understand everything that there is to understand about estimating models of continuous variables and no missing data in SCM framework.